Minister Mary Pangestu, thank you so much for joining us here at the Fung Global Institute. Mm -hmm. Let's kick off first with your uh, candidacy for the WTO leadership. What do you think you can bring? What is your USP for the role? My experience, I've uh, been working all my professional life uh, doing work on international trade. 25 years uh, of working on international trade and investment issues and trade and development issues. Uh, starting as an NGO, as a researcher doing policy work, and then in government in the last nine years, uh, including seven years as the, as the trade minister. So uh, I feel that I've seen how trade can transform a country. So I have uh, on the field knowledge uh, how uh, a country's development challenges are in terms of trying to make sure that trade and opening up will work for you uh, and, and how to make sure uh, that you have complementary policies that will ensure that the benefits of trade are more equally uh, shared. Uh, and uh, the Director General also has a role uh, as, if you like, the bridge builder or the honest broker, because at the end of the day you've got to find consensus between 159 members. Not easy, <laughs> given the, the different types of uh, uh, countries and levels of development that we have. Uh, and I have experienced uh, negotiations from bilateral, regional to multilateral negotiations where we have to find uh, consensus. And uh, I was also the coordinator of one of the uh, groups uh, within the, the WTO which comprised the 45 members to find a consensus on some of the development uh, issues. So I hope that that experience uh, will prepare me well uh, to, to uh, be sitting in this uh, position. One of the sticking points, of course, is agriculture in the Doha trade talks. Um, what could you bring to the table that you think could unblock that? Uh, well, it will, uh, it will depend again uh, on, on the members, but uh, I would like to continue to emphasize the importance of completing the agriculture negotiations because of the uh, gains that it would have for de uh, developing countries as well as for food security. Uh, and uh, it would correct the fundamental uh, trade distorting policies that are still in existence now in agriculture, which does have an impact, uh, which had an impact uh, on, on food security issues. It basically depressed the prices so that there was less incentive to invest in uh, production of agriculture or, and even research uh, in agriculture. Uh, and uh, the way forward is to hopefully be able to craft a, a balanced package between agriculture and other components, whether it's industrial goods or services, uh, and making sure that there's the development component uh, within that uh, is, is balanced uh, is, is the way forward. And we, we certainly hope that members uh, still have that aspiration uh, because the benefits would be, would be uh, tremendous uh, for all members. And one final question then about your candidacy. Is there something about the South-South South -South trade relationship that you think that you could deliver in a unique way that would set yourself, uh, yourself apart from the other candidates? Uh, well, we have to face the reality uh, that the large number of the membership of the WTO as well as the world economy is increasingly South-South, or not South-South, but South uh, focused in the sense that developing countries are growing are, uh, and there are emerging economies which have become uh, centers of economic growth uh, and in the post 2008 uh, financial crisis I think that's very clear uh, and in the trade numbers it, it actually shows that uh, in the last 10-15 years south-south uh, uh, trade has increased from like 30 percent to 50 percent so that means developing countries are, are trading more with each other as, as they grow. Uh, and that also means actually that uh, developing countries uh, are, are increasingly seeing the, the importance of trade for development and for growth. And it is a way that developing countries would integrate uh, into the world economy. Uh, and coming from a large developing country and having gone through uh, the way my country has been transformed with trade, I think will give me a better understanding of of the challenges that, that countries face when, when they go through this process. So I think the, uh, the, whoever is going to be the, the head of the WTO needs to have a good understanding uh, of development issues and how to balance the development issues, obviously, with 
the fact that you know you do have advanced countries, you have developed countries. How do you make sure uh, that the ba the interest uh, of all members uh, are served and the different speeds of uh, and preparedness uh, and capacity to to open up uh, and the complementary policies that are needed to make sure that the benefits of uh, opening up are widely shared between countries and within countries are, are also well understood. Uh, and there is also a component of what we call capacity building and aid for trade, uh, which is a being developed uh, separately from the mo current multilateral negotiations. But for developing countries, they see that as a very important component to make sure that they can uh, ensure, ensure that the benefits of trade uh, will be positive for their country and to be able to distribute it more evenly within their country. You said that you'd like to attract um, many more millions of tourists to Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Firstly, how do you plan to do that and in what way do you plan to do that sustainably? Our vision as a ministry is of course sustainable tourism. And uh, what does that mean? It, it means sustainable, of course, in the environmental sense. And it means uh, sustainable in the economic, uh, social, and cultural sense. Uh, we take a, a holistic view uh, of sustainability because what, what we really want is to have a destination which is being developed for tourism uh, to be sustainable in the environmental way uh, and uh, what we call green tourism or ecotourism. Uh, but we want to make sure that the uh, growth of tourism in that destination is going to be benefit the community or the people who are from that region and not have outsiders come in because then you know, you'll know you have tension and so on. So we have to also develop the physical infrastructure as well as the soft infrastructure. Uh, and uh, socially and culturally, it means that you also have to t pay attention uh, to making sure that you know modernization doesn't uh, ruin the actual uh, richness of the local cu culture. In fact, you want to preserve it and you want to develop it uh, in in a way which is uh, can be modern, can be contemporary without losing uh, the basic culture heritage of that uh, area. So this is uh, this is the the vision, and we are uh, this is what we're doing in the sixteen destinations. You want the numbers to rise, mm -hmm. um, but how do you plan to do that and matching the needs of Indonesia? Mm -hmm. You touched on mm -hmm. that just now, yeah. but maybe elaborate on yes. that a little. Uh, well, our target is 10 million by 2014 or 2015. Right now, we're, uh, last year we uh, received 8 million uh, visitors. Uh, and what we intend to do is to uh, promote in 16 major markets, including China. Our highest growth is coming from China and uh, uh, the other ASEAN uh, neighbors. Uh, and what we like to do is distinguish between uh, destinations which can accommodate mass tourism, uh, in, that is in large numbers, such as Bali, uh, Yogyakarta and its surrounding areas, and Jakarta. They, they can accommodate large numbers versus you know, areas like Raja Ampat. Uh, or Wakatobi, which are very specialized tourism uh, areas, or even Toraja, where you would, or Komodo, you know, Komodo Island, where you you don't want large numbers, but you want quality tourists. So we do we need to do both, you know, in a large country like Indonesia with mul multiple uh, destinations and diversified destinations. Uh, that is our intention, uh, and. Uh, even in, with, from a market like China, you know, you have different types of tourism coming from China. You have the general uh, large number that go uh, under tour groups. And then you, s I mean, China, as China has also developed, become more middle class, you, can, you will also find the more uh, higher end tourism already coming from China with very specialized interest. So uh, we, we need to do both uh, and we need to have c promotion campaigns that are uh, targeted at these different groups. Uh, and uh, European tourists and American tourists are still uh, high quality because they're, they stay longer. Average stay is about two weeks compared to Asian tourists, which is about one week. And therefore, they, they stay longer and they spend more. They, they, in fact, they spend three times more uh, in, that, in those two weeks uh, compared to one week uh, uh, of an of a Asian visitor. So that's why, again, that's why we diversify the markets. Uh, and they have quite different interests also. So this is um, uh, a way for us to develop different types of tourism. 
How will you ensure that the local communities, Indonesia is such a rich, mm -hmm. varied, disparate country, how will you ensure that the money is getting to the many tens of millions who are still living, you know, either on the poverty line or below the poverty mm -hmm. line in Indonesia? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and besides the foreign tourism that we just talked about, domestic tourism is also a huge uh, growth industry. Uh, and, you know, there are all types of tourism. You go from five, six star hotel all the way to homestays. Uh, and in some small uh, areas uh, or remote areas, homestays are a good answer uh, to accommodation. Uh, and there are actually tourists who will look for accommodation. So uh, what I'm trying to get at is that going back to, my, to our vision of sustainable tourism, you want the community uh, around that destination to be the one benefiting. And that's the way uh, to make sure uh, that the benefits of tourism in any area is going to the people who are from that area. So we need to develop uh, the industry, if you like, and the supporting uh, human resources that go with the industry hand in hand uh, with the different areas. So you, you, would, you could end up with the large resorts that we have in Bali where you would have a, a large number of being employed uh, in these hotels. And, and the, the good thing about tourism is that it's, it's, you know, in three months, six months, you can train uh, young people uh, to work in the hospital, hospitality industry. And a lot of them learn on the job, they learn uh, as they go. And, and then you can go all the way down to like homestays. We also have a program to encourage homestays in, in the more remote areas. And, uh, and, and that basically you're living uh, with the community uh, who are living there, like uh, Darawan for instance. Uh, it's, an, it's another island where you can uh, do diving. That whole island, uh, one of the islands, has, the whole island has been developed for homestay. So you're basically going there diving, but you're actually living with the community there. And, and that appeals to a certain class of tourists, and it benefits uh, the people directly. So it's a very sort of measured form of tourism, would you say? I mean, the danger with a booming economy like uh, Indonesia, where it's mm -hmm. registering 6% growth at the moment, is to really open up too much too quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we need to make sure, you know, like for instance, in the case of Bali, in some areas people felt that the, there was too much growth, you know, too many hotels uh, and, and uh, ruining the environment, yeah, and uh, not maybe necessarily uh, b being built according to the correct proper building code. So this is something that uh, we need to prevent. Uh, so you don't want to have too fast of a growth. And uh, in Bali, for instance, we have a rule, you cannot build above the coconut tree. That was a rule in, introduced in the 70s, and I think it was a good rule. Uh, but there have been some violations, so we have to prevent that. And we have to go to the next step, which is uh, making sure uh, that uh, all these resorts are sustainable. And it is actually part of our national climate change action plan that, you know, we as a tourism minister, we've been tasked to come up with the parameters, the standards, the guidelines uh, for what, what we call green hotel or green resort. Uh, and, and this is something we will, we have, we have started and we will continue to work. Uh, and also the, the uh, standards and the competency of the workers in the industry. That's also another thing that we're working uh, at in anticipation actually of the ASEAN economic community where you would have free movement uh, of of hospitality workers uh, between ASEAN countries. Minister, you have a very varied background. Let me ask you now about um, Indonesia as a country, as a very vibrant and mm. free and open democracy where people do express themselves very freely. One of the issues that um, has been raised in Indonesia is this sense of inequity, if you like, despite the booming uh, growth, despite the high GDP figures. How do you think you can kind of integrate that into your ministry? Uh, I think tourism is actually a good way to, to reduce uh, inequity because we can actually try to develop tourism uh, in, you know, remote areas uh, and, and, and generate income directly uh, to, to the community around there. So basically what we're trying to do to reduce inequities is, first of all, infrastructure and connectivity. You know, how do you, uh, in six, our 16 destinations, for instance, are spread across the country. How do you make sure that uh, the infrastructure is being built uh, to, to be able to receive uh, the, the uh, transportation that comes in? Then you need to have the connectivity, whether it's the aircrafts or the boats or the cruises that would come. Uh, so you, you, 
have you make the access available uh, for visitors to come. But at the same time, you have to, in parallel, you have to prepare the destination, uh, the industry, uh, and the community around it uh, to be able to participate in, in the growth. Let's touch on the infrastructure and the challenges of that in Indonesia. Well, you know, we, uh, we are a very large country and we're an archipelago. So uh, the challenge of uh, having infrastructure to make connectivity happen is quite challenging. But we have a stage-by-stage -stage program. Uh, and for instance, uh, for in the next three years, we're going to develop 10 ports for cruise tourism. And there will be about 70 airports from large to small, which will be developed in the next three years, uh, both for obviously not just tourism, but uh, in general trade uh, and, and economic accessibility. Uh, and then you have to have the actual transportation uh, services and logistic services when you talk about uh, distribution of goods. Because part of this infrastructure uh, building and connectivity is really uh, 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 intended not just for efficiency uh, and economic reasons, but also for equity reasons to reduce poverty. Because uh, that, that way you can have a, a more equitable price you know, uh, a lower price uh, for the basic goods like rice uh, and so on. So that helps the poor uh, uh, also. Uh, and uh, that's really uh, the challenge for Indonesia ahead. And what about the um, global value supply chain as well in terms of what you do right now? Yeah. How do you hope to move Indonesia up that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole development of the global value chain has been very interesting because basically, the, empirically, it shows that uh, if you are a competitive uh, part of the uh, global value chain, uh, you need to be very open uh, for uh, imported inputs as well as uh, services that, that make uh, the global value chain efficient and competitive. Uh, and therefore, you can be anywhere in that global value chain and participate. Uh, if you have the connectivity, the accessibility, including the information communications uh, co connectivity. Uh, and the way uh, we see it, uh, we can do a lot of outsourcing uh, in the services area, uh, which involves a lot of the creative industries uh, in Indonesia, like animation, like film, like design, uh, and uh, also in the manufacturing, you know, for, for production of components uh, and so on. Uh, and what it is is about increasing the value added uh, of, of your production of goods and services. And we've seen a lot of interesting examples uh, of uh, the way of the future, I would say, uh, where we have seen outsourcing of, say, animation. You know, we have companies in Indonesia which are already doing uh, animation for Hollywood. And we, we see comic, uh, comic book companies uh, who are just employing 25 young people who are very artistic, who are doing the drawing and, and so on for uh, Marvel comics. We've seen clusters develop not just in Jakarta, in Jogja, in Malang, which is in uh, East Java, and Bali, uh, and, and Batam. There's a big animation and film studio in Batam. So we're doing a lot of this already. Uh, and I think the basis or the uh, competitiveness of Indonesia is actually in its creative people. Uh, because we have a, a rich culture heritage, uh, the arts-based uh, co competitiveness of Indonesia is actually quite strong. Mm -hmm. Indonesia, like India, has a growing population, mm -hmm. unlike some other countries in Asia, um, Japan, for example. Mm -hmm. That is a real challenge for people at the top like yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, a, it's a, both an opportunity as well as a challenge. Uh, on the challenge side, uh, you know, again going back to your question about global value chain, you have to invest in education uh, and training and, and identifying the skill set that you want to have uh, go with the uh, young people so that they can be gainfully employed and hopefully at you know, higher and higher levels of income. Uh, and part of that also includes, I would say, entrepreneurship. Uh, and, because a lot of the, the young people uh, could uh, be gainfully employed uh, by setting up their own businesses, even small businesses. And then you have to develop the whole ecosystem of uh, you know, access to finance, microfinance, uh, and so on. So uh, that's uh, certainly uh, what we plan to do. Uh, and in terms of the uh, growth of the middle class and, and the young population, uh, it is also an opportunity uh, because right now the size of the middle class, according to McKinsey, is about 45 million. 
uh, and that means a lot of demand for goods and services and lifestyle, yeah, lifestyle products. By 2030, it's going to be 130 million. So it, it is a very sizable uh, market. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we have what's called a demographic dividend. Uh, the uh, proportion of our population, which is in the uh, productive uh, age group of 14 to 65, is going to be larger than the, the very young and the very old until about 2025. Uh, and that means it's, it's uh, the, the way your market is structured, as well as the fact that you have uh, productive human resources for some many years to come.